Brown University. We, uh, uh, we want to thank you so much for, uh, for being out here and inviting us to be here. Both of us are part of something called the Triple Crisis Blog, um, where, I, where we talk about this stuff all the time after the financial crisis. Uh, we thought there wasn't really a great uh, global debate that was inclusive with, uh, with economists and political scientists and academics that think uh, progressively about these things. So we created a blog. So we got about 30 different people from India, from Brazil, from the United States, uh, blogging about the crisis, about finance, about climate change, and about development uh, all the time. So I encourage you all to, uh, to check it out and, and hear more about the kind of things that we're talking about today. It's www.triplecrisis.com. Um, we, called our, we called what we're going to talk about today the austerity game and the global impacts of Wall Street. My friend Mark's going to talk about the austerity game and I'll talk about the global impacts. Talk, we'll just talk for about 20 minutes and then hopefully we can have a conversation and get off the soapbox and talk. Yeah. Hi everyone. Okay. If I seem a little stiff, well first of all I apologize for the accent. I got the same voice as Shrek. So if you've seen Shrek you should have no problem with the translation. Uh, if I'm a little stiff it's because I threw my back out. So if I start moving like this that's pretty much what's going on. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to start off by saying. What? <laughs> Everyone has a smartphone. All right. Um, you're here because you're pissed off. You have every right to be pissed off. I'm pissed off too. But the problem with being pissed off is it tends to like run off in multiple directions all at once. You need to be pissed off about the right things. It's taken me a long time to figure out what I think the right things are. So I want to share that with you. You can disagree about that, but I think we need to be on some kind of same page. Otherwise, we all just get written off as a bunch of cranks, and discontents, and malcontents. So we did do something better than that. I came to the United States 20 years ago. I wanted to join an open, inclusive, plural, multicultural, exciting society. 20 years later, I don't know what the hell happened. So you know the numbers on this, but I'm going to remind you of it because it should be emblazoned into your forehead so you remember this. So if anyone talks to you about this, we're all on the same page. In 2007, the top 1% of the United States takes home 24% of all the income. In, 19, in 1976, they took home 9%. Since 1978, the bottom 40% of wage earners have seen their income stand still. There has been no real wage increase when you adjust for prices. The top 1% currently have 38% of the country's wealth. The top 400 Americans own as much as the bottom 150 million. 47, Americans, 47 million Americans live in a family of four on less than $22,300 a year. 52 million Americans have no health care coverage in the richest country in the world. This isn't the place I joined 20 years ago. This is Brazil in the 1960s. This is Mexico in the 1970s. This is the income distribution sure of a developing country. Yeah, make sure I didn't mishear you. Top 100 and bottom 150 million. 400, 400. 100, 150 million. So there's plenty of injustice to go around on this. But I've been asked to talk about austerity politics, the idea that basically we've all spent too much and now we have to cut everything back. All right? Well, here's the thing. Who's actually spent too much? Well, we hear it's the government spent too much. There's been an orgy of government spending. Yeah, the funny thing is, if you actually look at really the numbers, it's kind of not true because there's a 76% jump in government debt since 2008. What happened in 2008? There would be the $2 trillion we paid to the banking system to not fail, and then the $2.2 trillion in executive compensation they've awarded themselves since that point. So when you take account for that, I mean, if there was an orgy in government spending, it'd be kind of nice because we'd see it. There'd be new schools, Amtrak wouldn't suck. You know, there'd be things that we'd actually have things to point for. And clearly that hasn't happened. So in a sense, where has all the money gone? Well, it went basically to support the financial system. That's where it is. This is a big myth. It's not true. There has been a lot of government spending. It all went to 87% of it is a direct payback. Either recapitalizing, re liquidating, or all bumping up the financial system. Now, if this is the case, you've seen this massive increase in government debt. What's the second order injustice? The second order injustice isn't just the way that things have worked out distributionally, it's the fact that we're being asked to pay for it. Well, so we're about wanting this straight, right? So the people who've got all the stuff screw up. Then they get bailed with our money, and now we got to pay it back. 
I mean, this is literally the deal that we have been asked to sign on to because we've all spent too much. Now we have to have the moment of austerity. Really, that's a pretty strange way of thinking about it. So the rich screw up and the poor get to pay for it. That's a good one. Why did we get into this position? Well, many people these days say that we shouldn't have built the banks. And I'm one of the people from right from the start said we had to. And I'll tell you why I thought that and why I've actually changed my mind about this. So it goes like this. The 158 million Americans in the labor market, that's how many of us go to work every day. Of that, 72% of us rely on paycheck to paycheck to make our payments. They have no savings because of that income skew, because of the fact that we just don't have income. We also have 50, 55 million handguns. So imagine what would happen if there were no money in the ATMs, if we really did let the whole system go down and there's no groceries. And it goes on for days, weeks, months. So everyone got frightened. We thought we have to bail these guys because if we don't, I mean, they do, they provide paychecks. They put the money in the ATMs. I mean, how are we going to get groceries? How are we going to put food on the table? Of course we need to do this. They had us over a barrel. We discovered those magic words, too big to fail. <coughs> and at the time, I didn't realize the significance of this. But the significance is truly profound because what it means is too big to fail is you can never let them fail. And if you can never let them fail, they don't fail. So just like the bratty teenager with indulgent parents who gets to do what it wants because it knows that the mom and dad's going to bail it out no matter what, they're going to take every excessive risk they damn well can and award themselves the bonuses they want and hold off. And you won't be able to do a damn thing about it because at the end of the day, they're too big to fail. Now, what was the point of the for this? What was meant to happen to make this okay? They were going to make the magic come back. They're going to bring back growth. That's the deal, right? Everything's going great. Look, we're all fine. Look, my house is going up in value. Everything's fabulous, right? I mean, you know, 2006, we weren't doing this in 2006. We were worried about Britney Spears' comeback in 2006. That's where we were. It's just wonderful. Let's bring it back. Let's bring back the magic. But what was the magic? The magic was credit. The magic was more debt for people who haven't had that income increase in over 20 years. The magic was taking more money out of your house on the assumption that somehow like a magic money pump, it had magically increased in value. You could take out this whole metric line of credit and spend it on what? On healthcare, on your kids' education, on things that you should be able to afford in the first place. But they couldn't bring it back. They talk about why, basically it's because their business model's dead, but I won't bore you with the details. But like the dinosaurs of old, the meteor hit, it takes a while for them to eventually die off. So you don't need to worry about Wall Street could die and in the long run it's already there, trust me, I can tell you why. But in the short term, they've got what bankers call a free option. They basically get to play, you have to pay regardless of the outcome. We are their insurance policy. And when you have that written into the fabric, when you have that as the basic standard operating procedure of an institution, they will abuse it just like a bratty teenager. Now given all this, we're still being told that we need to cut back. We need to get rid of that terrible government debt. But there's terrible private sector debt. And if we all cut it simultaneously, all we do is make the whole economy shrink. More to the point, I don't hear so much about the people who have got 38% of national wealth really paying back for all the good times that they had over the past 20 years. So there has to be a question of equity. There has to be some kind of question of fairness in this distribution. It's absolutely true, student debt is out of control. And the chances of a labor market where you've got a real unemployment rate of 16%, that's because what it really is. When you're gonna go out there and somehow pay back 40, 50, 60, 90,000 dollars in student debt. So you're basically barring poor people from going to college. The formal access doesn't matter that. When you've got people who cannot pay hospital bills, how does getting a credit pump again, how, do, how does this work? Clearly, we need to think a little bit harder than this. But simply punishing the people who don't have to pay for the mistakes of those who did seems to be the most ass backward thing you can imagine. But yet, that's precisely the position we find ourselves in today. Even Obama says that we've spent too much and we need to cut it back. Well, just be honest then. Admit that 87% of that spending since 2008 has been on these guys and not on us. Because if it was on us, then the poop would be on us and we should pay it back. But I don't see myself flying off down to Providence every day when I go to work in a brand new super electric train because of the orgy of infrastructure expenditure that's gone on. I don't see school outcomes for like grade schools going through the roof because of hiring so many teachers. So that's just not the case. 
This is the greatest bait and switch in human history. Two trillion dollars of private debt gets smuggled in and rechristened as two trillion dollars of public debt, and now it becomes the public's problem. The public didn't generate that. So how do we get out of this? Don't focus on the trivia. Don't focus on esoteric schemes. Don't focus on the fact that we're going to reinvent all of capitalism. Maybe in the long run, maybe the oil crisis coming in 20 years will take care of that for us. We don't know. But here, right now, just a simple one. Too big to fail is morally, ethically, and economically wrong. Everyone should have to bear the responsibility of their actions, regardless of whether they're citizens or bankers. And if that's the case, the one policy that we need to do is a very old one. In 1933, it was called the Glass-Steagall Act. That's right. And you cut it right in the middle. And if you want to run that casino with other your friends' money, great. No backstop. You don't get to write that on us. We are not your insurance policy. The captain goes down with the ship. I got no problem with that. Well, if you make a gajillion dollars in investments, fine. You do not come to me when it goes wrong. And then the other part of it, the commercial banking side, then they might actually pay attention to us. Then they might, rather than being seduced by the possibility of a 40% return on a currency swap, actually invest in a business. Actually open up something that will create jobs. Actually restore hope. Remember that one. So that's what we need to do. One simple thing. Tell everyone. It'll make a difference. Thanks. Thank you.